Greetings, class. Um, I hope you've had a good break from things. I apologize that I didn't get the last reading up before I found myself without internet access for the better part of a week. Uh, but here we are. I'm trying to get everything uh, back on schedule now. So we are transitioning again. Uh, we're through now with our mental health module. Uh, the last reading that we had was from Ken McLeish when McLeish was talking about uh, the limitations even of the moral injury diagnosis, or it's not really a diagnosis, um, but something kind of like one. Um, the ways that um, McLeish argues that moral injury can serve um, is kind of a way of moving the discursive goalposts, if you will, um, not only making sure that veterans and veterans suffering stay centered in the debate about uh, war ethics and the costs of war, uh, but increasingly framing soldiers as occupants of a higher form of morality, somewhere, uh, something different that's somewhere privileged over civilian forms of morality. So that concluded our uh, mental health and combat trauma module. Where we talked about combat trauma, the degree to which combat trauma frames our current discussions about war. So for this next module, we're going to be talking about the modern warrior. Uh, we talked in our first module about a whole range of ways that fighting people, um, mar various martial identities, warriors if you will, uh, are socially framed and understood within the context of their own societies. Uh, we're going to turn our attention now to the social context of the contemporary warfighter, particularly based on uh, a model that has grown uh, and developed in North America and Europe. Um, I originally had this section arranged a little bit differently than it is now, uh, but now we're starting with uh, a reading from James Gibson. So a couple of times this semester already, I've referenced uh, Gibbs, Gibson's work in passing. Uh, for this segment, I want to be clear that when I'm referring to the modern soldier uh, or the contemporary warfighter, that what I'm talking about is an archetype, and it's an archetype that developed during and after the Vietnam War. Gibson is a sociologist, and he began this research in the early 1980s. He observed um, <clears throat> uh, he observed uh, that there was the development of paramilitarism uh, in the United States, uh, something that happened um, kind of the kind of the pr these these private militias that started to develop, particularly in rural areas, but in other in some urban areas as well. Um, he saw this happening in the United States, groups of men, usually white men, arming themselves and stockpiling weapons. Uh, this is something that we do continue to see in America, uh, in American society today. But what Gibson's talking about is something that he saw developing uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, and then becoming even more prominent in the 1990s, which is when he was um, writing this book. So Gibson did ethnographic fieldwork. We've talked about ethnographic fieldwork earlier in the semester. He did his fieldwork with a group of uh, militia, a militia group who was doing training uh, for, um, you know, war fighting, guerrilla warfare, that sort of thing. He was a little bit covert about his um, movement into that group. Some might say that those are uh, questionable research ethics. Um, I'll let you be the judge about that. So Gibson... Um, takes up this idea early on that the notion of the idealized fighting man or war hero is something that really started to change. The, the image of what this is is something that started to change during and after the Vietnam War. Uh, I'm going to reference a um, period of time in, in this lecture. Uh, this may or may not be familiar to you, maybe it is, uh, but there's this period of time in American history that we tend to refer to as the culture wars. Uh, some people would say that we are in the second wave of the culture wars right now, uh, as evidenced by uh, several social movements surrounding uh, the election of Donald Trump uh, and uh, lots of other social movements that are going on right now. But for our purposes here, when I refer to the culture wars, I'm referring to a moment uh, that grew out of the end of the Vietnam War and kind of peaked during the 1990s. Uh, this is, in a lot of ways, the context that Gibson is writing from. Uh, 
Uh, but he's fo focusing now on how this set of contexts have shaped the way that people, particularly American men, particularly white American men, think about war violence and uh, violence per se. So what are these contexts that I'm referring to? Well, um, starting out, the 1960s happened, and then the 70s. Uh, what I'm referring to um, particularly are two major social events. One of these social events was the Vietnam War. Uh, the other was a set of social movements that I'm going to oversimplify uh, by calling the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and what were the outcomes of these two um, major social events? Well, with the Civil Rights Movement, though not every goal was realized, we're still working on some of those now, there was a significant, at least from some perspectives, there was a significant public address of the discrimination that's experienced by a lot of people in American society, by African Americans, Native Americans, women, basically everyone who is not a heteronormative white male citizen uh, with money, and laws that overtly discriminated against all these groups started to be overturned during this period. Uh, there started to be a national conversation about allowing same-sex marriage, um, and there was the Roe versus Wade uh, Supreme Court decision. Uh, there started to be changes in television programming. Uh, prior to this moment, television shows overwhelmingly portrayed white Americans, uh, often in rural settings. Uh, the, the appearance of these shows was very conservative. Uh, but at, at this time, the 60s, especially in the 70s, television shows uh, became much more multicultural. They started to take place in an urban setting. Um, there was also the secularization of public education that started to become much more clear during this era, so forth and so forth. Um, and, and this was a major uh, precondition of the culture wars. Uh, so then there was the Vietnam War that I talked about. So with Vietnam, uh, the statement that I'm going to make here continues to be controversial in some, um, some circles uh, in the United States even today. Um, but the United States lost the Vietnam War. Uh, not only did the United States lose the Vietnam War, but the United States lost the Vietnam War to an impoverished, non-white, uh, Southeast Asian group of peasants in brutal combat. Um, and all of this took place while a substantial portion of the U.S. population vocally opposed this war. So. The culture wars grew out of this moment when um, a lot of parts of dominant American national mythology started to be challenged in a substantial and public way. A particular group of people in the United States, uh, not exclusively, but particularly white men, uh, conservative white men, started to feel uh, very threatened in this moment and started to feel like everything that made sense in the world Everything that made sense in their society was being turned upside down. Um, a good example, if, if uh, y'all might be a little young for this, maybe not, uh, but there was a sitcom in the 1970s called All in the Family, uh, and the lead character was this uh, conservative white man named Archie Bunker, who um, was increasingly looking just more and more ridiculous in a world that was changing around him and was just not making sense to him. Um, this was sort of that moment in time uh, that we're referring to here. So for many men, uh, the loss of the Vietnam War was a major wounding of the ego, um, the white ego, the male ego, and the American national ego was really wounded by losing the Vietnam War. And a lot of people could not accept it. Uh, basically, they couldn't accept that the Vietnam War was lost, fair and square, that uh, basically the United States got beaten on the battlefield and lost. Uh, and uh, people thought there had to be a reason this happened. It couldn't have been that our soldiers weren't good enough. It couldn't have been that we weren't strong enough or that we didn't have the, the, the best tactics. There had to have been something else that caused us to lose this war. It could not have been that those poor Southeast Asian people just beat us in, in battle fair and square. So people started to rationalize that what had happened uh, 
was the social foundation of the United States was crumbling. Uh, morality was falling apart. Men were walking down the street holding hands with men. People were growing long hair. Uh, black people were being elected in important political positions and were being represented in the media. Uh, kids were waving communist flags and burning American flags and that must be it. That must be the reason. The, the brave men who went to war in Vietnam must have lost because the United States was falling apart morally and was not supporting them properly. Um, in this moment, there was a massive social backlash against the achievements of the civil rights movement. Uh, the idea that the soldiers in Vietnam had been betrayed by America started to take root. And this is where we start to see um, these changes in the representation of war heroes in, in media. Uh, we talked about this earlier in the semester. We had a conversation about how after the Vietnam War, there started to be a change in the way that war heroes were portrayed in books and in movies and things like that. And I remember some of you um, responded to that and, and said, yes, I've seen, I've seen this. I observe uh, this, um, this change in representation that we're, we're talking about. Prior to the Vietnam War, war heroes were portrayed by these John Wayne type characters. They were patriotic and clean cut uh, soldiers and police officers uh, who saved the day by being brave and following the rules, uh, following orders, uh, defeating evil that was coming from outside, from other places, uh, basically through following the rules and, and adhering to uh, the established moral code of American society. And after the Vietnam War, the war heroes got much darker and much grittier, and the enemy that they were fighting against changed. Uh, this is where we start to see these characters starting to pop up, people like Rambo and like Dirty Harry uh, and, and others. And these new characters no longer save the day by following rules and fighting outside threats to America. These new war heroes often save the day by breaking the rules because the rules are corrupt and the enemies are often domestic. Dirty Harry has to break the rules to enforce his view of proper justice. Uh, even though he's a cop, sometimes he has to resort to vigilante justice because the police are inept and weak. Uh, in, in Rambo, he goes to war against the United States government. Uh, he was a tortured POW in Vietnam who came home to a crowd of hippies who spit on him and called him a baby killer. And these representations are not accidental. Uh, these kinds of characters became the new archetype for a lot of people. And when people tried to imagine what it meant to be a hero in America in the modern day, these are the types of characters that people started to imagine. So it's in this moment, the aftermath of these changes, that Gibson observes the emergence of these paramilitary groups and militias, groups that were usually but not exclusively uh, composed of white men, fiercely anti-government, and committed to the idea of violently overthrowing the corrupt, immoral social order that they understand uh, contemporary society to operate according to and restoring, and restoring is a very important word here, uh, returning America to its former glory uh, in the old days, in the old way, where there were established hierarchies and things were ordered and there were conservative social rules that everyone followed and everything made sense. And this is where you will also see um, really the emergence of people who started to do things like buying um, military-style weapons in mass, uh, stockpiling them, uh, people prepping for the coming social apocalypse, fantas fantasizing about when it all hits the fan one day and the strong, tactically proficient, morally straight men, usually white men, can reestablish the proper social order that was lost uh, during and after this Vietnam War and Civil Rights era period. So this is where uh, Gibson uses this word warrior. Uh, and claims that these people were beginning to imagine themselves as warriors, uh, which is something that's kind of different from what used to be imagined as the ideal American uh, fighting man 
in soldiers and police officers, uh, the way that they were represented in media prior to this time, this new warrior archetype is something that's different in some ways. Um, so before I end, uh, I want to be clear that at the time that Gibson was writing this, uh, the movement that he's discussing was, at least for the most part, mostly confined to paramilitary groups. Um, it really wasn't a significant or a, a, at least a majority mainstream uh, force or something with a significant representation in the actual military or uh, police force. However, he was concerned that people were blowing this off. Uh, he noted, uh, for example, that when these Rambo movies came out that we talked about, that many people in the public, people in positions of authority and, and positions of you know high culture in the United States, um, saw these films as absolutely ridiculous. They saw them as ridiculous and garish, and they just failed to imagine that there were actually significant numbers of people, men and boys in particular, who were watching these movies and seeing these characters as real heroes, uh, as the kind of people that they aspired to be. So um, I'm going to end there and uh, take care, and I'll see you all soon.